Good evening, Valery Viktorovich. Good evening. Good evening, dear viewers, listeners and guests in the studio. Today is January 13th, 2020. In essence, we have one big question. We received, of course, many questions. But one way or another, all of them are related to the events connected with Iran. What would be a comment on the assassination of Soleimani, Boeing's plane shot down, and all other events around it? There is a complex of issues and events connected with and happening around Iran. Some of them were so prominent that some analytics end up saying, that is it, we are almost at the threshold of the Third World War. But these analytics who vocalized those words or even thought along those lines must be fired for professional incompetence. The visit of our государь Vladimir Putin to Syria in close proximity of discussed events was an indicator that the situation was not critical at all and could not expand into some sort of combat actions. There could not be a more concrete signal that everything will play out, like certain show, and there is no war on the horizon. This visit is more than an obvious proof of that. Regarding Iran, it is impossible to fully understand all these events without understanding of five types of social power without understanding that besides domestic and foreign politics, there exist global politics, without understanding priorities of governance, full function of governance, and main points of COPE, conception of social safety, and DOTU, sufficiently general theory of governance. But everything comes to one point. Iran must become the center of governance and replace Europe, in other words, the Euro-Asian part of global predictor transfers to Iran, the Euro-Atlantic part of global predictor transfers to China. Transfer to China is more or less successful. Transfer to Iran has very big difficulties. One simple thing must be understood here. Some intellectualize. Moscow, meaning Russia, did this and will do that. Washington, meaning the USA, did that and will do this. Tehran, meaning Iran, did this and will do that. This approach has nothing to do with reality. There are people who think Trump is a businessman, he is not a warrior, and so on. It is nonsense. Those people show a complete lack of understanding of governance processes. One simple thing must be understood. I won't repeat here theses about state that were published in our book State and articles War and Bolshevism is a natural basis of Russia. I will make another obvious point, which is missing in the book. Probably it will appear in the second edition. Any state politics, governance, is established dynamic balance of different clan cooperative groups' capabilities, their proportion, to use the government system and its mechanisms for reaching their narrow clan cooperative goals. This must be understood. One more time. State, politics, governance is established dynamic balance of different clan cooperative groups' capabilities, their proportion, to use the government system and its mechanisms for reaching their narrow clan cooperative goals. Different interests of different clan cooperative groups represented in state governance 
dictate the situation when a certain balance must always be found between the interests of each clan cooperative group in order that they all agree to one or the other governance maneuver. But political oaths, political talk show quote-unquote experts witness such maneuver and begin to explain some actions by certain personal traits of a given politician or his relations with other politician or politicians. He did it because Example, their assessment of current events in the United States. Trump is a businessman, not a warrior. Bolton is a hawk, and so on. In reality, it must be understood that behind every state politician there is a certain clan cooperative group. A politician expresses goals of that group. Zelensky in Ukraine is a prime and obvious example. Well. It couldn't be more obvious with Zelensky. Zelensky is a nobody. He is a clown, tired of playing the piano. But people of Ukraine choose him. That very talent of the statesman apparently was the most important to be elected. He won and immediately left for a vacation. Well, you take care of the country problems now. Also, apportion our state governance between each other. The personality of any manager is just a little trait of a given maneuver. It is a little aspect, a hue, that personality lives with the maneuver. But it is not a goal of a decision taken. It is not a reason for a maneuver. So keeping in mind the existence of balance within clan cooperative groups, one can say that politics of Moscow is such and such, Politics of Washington is such and such. Politics of Tehran is such and such. Only regarding processes that have already happened. On top of that, the process must also take a certain interval of time. So there is a process, not just a certain fact. And one cannot state about continuous politics by analyzing separately every action, every event. Why? Because any given action of a state in the future will be affected by different clan cooperative groups, and that will be expressed through state politics. First, the action in the future will be supported. Second, the action in the future will be corrected. Third, the action in the future will be disavowed in some part up to the complete reverse of the action to the opposite action. All of it we could witness within a short period of time in Iran as an example. That is why I explained some theoretical thesis beforehand. Without comprehension of all of the above, it would be impossible to understand the actions of the United States, Iran and other countries. State governance of any country, not even a state, but any country, it is always a dynamic proportional balance of capabilities between different clan cooperative groups. In order to use the government system, state structure to pursue narrow cooperative goals, there is no other scenario in a crowd elite society. Some say Putin should fire this, Putin should hire this. It is easier to say those things than to provide stability of governance. It is a different situation in principle and informational processes are very important. Regarding Iran, there are three groups of tasks are being solved. Firstly, continue to work on establishing Iran as the center of governance concentration of global processes. Despite Iran not having seemingly its best foot forward most of the time, this goal is on the agenda. Secondly, support of the clan cooperative group in Iran, 
which is most correlated with the goal of establishing Iran as the center of governance concentration of global processes. Thirdly, strengthen Trump in his opposition with the US country lead and accordingly liquidation of the United States as a world gendarme. All these tasks can be divided into four groups as well, where we would divide the third group into two subgroups. First, Iran should become the center of governance concentration. In order to achieve that, the certain clan cooperative group in Iran should be supported. The United States should stop acting as a world gendarme. In order to achieve that, the clan cooperative group in the US associated with Trump should be supported. Same tasks can be divided in two pools. Pool number one. A. Iran should become governance concentration center. B. The clan cooperative group that will work towards that goal should be supported. Pool number two. A. The United States should stop acting as a world gendarme. B. The certain clan cooperative group in the US should be supported. As you can see, tasks can be put in different pools, but most appropriate are three pools grouping, because the point about Trump and the point about the United States is the same point. Everything that happened with Iran was done by the US country elite. But the beneficiary party is the global elite. The US country elite tried to solve all these tasks in the opposite direction, to prevent Iran from becoming a governance concentration center, to weaken the clan cooperative group in Iran that worked towards that goal, and to weaken Trump's position and keep the United States as a world gendarme. Well, the result for the US country elite was negative. They work, work and couldn't believe their own eyes. How did this happen? We had worked so hard but got an exactly opposite result. Why? I said it several times before, that the US country elite doesn't know, not to mention Russian elite, who not only don't know anything, but moreover, they even don't want to know anything. How to govern complex social super systems, how to conduct politics of a global level of responsibility, and what is conceptual power of global level of responsibility. They simply don't know about conceptual power at all. So the US country elite shouldn't sit down to play cards with the global elite in general. Because the global elite in any game has four jokers in their sleeve. That means the global elite will win in any case. The only issue is that the process will be prolonged in time. Regarding the issues we are discussing today, I can say that there was excitement only at the beginning, when certain decisions were not taken and mass media hadn't yet published certain information, which was obvious if to review it from the point of the conception of social safety, COP, and DOTO, sufficiently general theory of governance, i.e. by using the methodology of data processing according to the conception of social safety. Everything was obvious. But later, the information in mass media began to flow, and as a result of that flow, there was nothing left to do but to register different events. There is one more aspect that needs to be cleared, and this aspect confuses many analytics today. How did the United States kill General Soleimani? And how did Iran end up as a partner of the United States? Some go nuts trying to figure it out. Also, there is nothing extraordinary in all of it. 
Let's begin from the start. Why and how was Soleimani killed? Regarding the assassination of Soleimani, in historic perspective, this assassination is equivalent to the assassination of Ernesto Che Guevara. How so? It is very simple. Look, Ernesto Che Guevara was killed, and this leader and personality of the world revolutionary movement is now the source of profit for world capitalists. They produce different merchandise and clothes with his image. In other words, they made a brand of Che Guevara and are making money by distributing world revolutionary movement. An interesting detail, isn't it? But what has Soleimani to do with it? Let's see how did Che Guevara die. In 1959, the Socialist Revolution, that is how it is called today, was victorious in Cuba, and Che Guevara, one of the ardent revolutionaries, became the first head of the National Bank of Cuba. But he was an ardent revolutionary. He thought that we will solve world poverty through revolution. We came on grandma, overthrew the government, and that is it, happiness to all immediately. We bring happiness. But he didn't understand one thing. As a manager, he was weak, very weak, despite his first key position within the state governance. He didn't understand that revolution is an evolutionary process in principle. In principle, and as a rule, revolutions take place unnoticed. It can be observed during change of technological paradigm, when technological paradigm is followed by social change of the society. Knowledge is spreading within society, and new social relations are wanted. New professions appear, old professions disappear, and people's interdependence changes all the time. But sometimes the change of social structure doesn't happen within a normal course of events. In that case, revolution brings change into the social paradigm of society. Revolution can take place in different forms, with different levels of violence, up to a military coup. But for a revolution to be successful, certain conditions need to be created to ensure the survival of a new governance system based on new principles. If such conditions are not provided, then I can cite a short jingle here. A coup cannot be victorious, otherwise it isn't called a coup. In other words, if conditions for functioning of this new system aren't met, then the system will fail, and it will be called a coup. What did the masters of the World Revolutionary Movement do? They understood that this young man with ardent eyes will simply wipe off everything on his way. He will be a nuisance here. Why not to use him differently? Let's make of him a symbol of the struggle. And he left Cuba in 1965 to do the World Revolution. He went to a couple of places before ending up in Bolivia. A special group was sent to Bolivia to do a half-year hunt. But he got captured in the first week. The group got the order to execute him by shooting. 
As a result, Che Guevara turned into the world revolutionary brand. It would seem strange that I talk about Iran and events around Iran, but bring into picture unrelated issues. Without understanding these simple things, it is impossible to understand what is happening around Iran. Moreover, I cannot say everything here. I am afraid that I won't be able to even mention some very important things here, because they would lead me to other, also important things. Nevertheless, I'll try to give a big picture. What is common between Che Guevara and Soleimani? Why did Soleimani die? There is a well-known saying. Rank imposes obligations. In original French it sounds noblesse oblige, which means a noble rank imposes its obligations. In our case, a rank in governance system imposes its obligations. If the rank doesn't impose, then the very rank kills, first kills morally. So Suleimani is always mentioned in superlative terms. What a specialist, what a warrior, he is such, such and such. The level of Suleimani's worship in Iran is over the top. He is a national hero. He is respected within the whole Shiite world. And as a result of all of it, he was raised to the level where he should self-define himself in the processes of Iran state governance and in the processes of the global level of significance. When he was pushed up, in fact, he was raised based on his military background and heroic acts in the anti-terrorist activity. They started making him a political figure. But he said, no, I am only a soldier, I don't know politics. He had to decide for himself. Either he is a political actor or he is a soldier, and his name shouldn't be present in the political processes. Well, what can I do? They worship me, they glorify me. In general, the Eastern tradition of glorification is very dangerous, especially in this regard. And as a result, he was used, maybe even against his will, despite his actions one way or another, being designed to be political, as a puppet in political schemes. So he became a burden for global players who work on transforming Iran into the governance concentration center of the world processes. He became one too many out of place figure that led to the issue of his liquidation. But how to eliminate him? He must die in such a way to become a symbol of anti-American struggle. Why was Suleimani chosen to be the symbol of anti-American struggle? Because his main field of activity was fighting for the Islamic population's liberation from ISIS and the Americans in Syria in Iraq. That means he was physically outside of Iran borders and by this sheer fact already had an international relevance. Taking into consideration this fact, he should have been more careful, but he thought that politics is something out of his domain and he has nothing to do with it. 
Yes, I will express my dislike here, my support over there, but I am out of politics. How is that? You supported one process and blocked another one. Your opinion is followed by crowds, which are governed by other people. Your voice is being used to announce one idea or another, and accordingly, he should be eliminated, but being made a martyr and raised on a banner. His destiny was to become Islamic revolutionary brand. But how to assassinate Soleimani? Syria begins to calm down. Thanks to Russia's intervention and mortification of terrorist movement in the region, Turkey, being involved in different processes in the region, understood that it is more beneficial for Turkey to be on Russia's good side, so Turkey will step back in Syria. But Turkey was on one side with terrorists, ISIS, Turkey supported them to fight against the legal government of Syria. Turkey doesn't want to deal with the ISIS problem. It has the problem with Kurds, which is more than enough for Turkey. That means what? That means that all these ISIS fighters must be relocated somewhere. And Turkey found the solution. We should fight for Mediterranean oil and gas deposits. For that exact purpose, we entered Libya and supported the terrorist government of national salvation. Erdogan didn't understand one simple thing. The West will use, abuse and refuse him. The West needs a monkey pulling chestnuts from the fire to solve some specific governance tasks in a certain region, in Libya, for example. There was a principal task in Libya after toppling Gaddafi, whom to appoint as a scapegoat. Europe distanced itself from Libya, but Turkey entered Libya. It wants to control natural resource deposits around Cyprus. Turkey entered and the West winked at it. Go on, guys, get bugged down into it. And suddenly, Haftar forces began to advance. Haftar forces represent real national liberation movement aimed at restoring the state of Libya. But Turkey is fully tied to Libya's puppet regime, the government of national accord. And Turkey had an eureka moment. Aha, that is not a problem. We need to dispose of ISIS fighters in Syria and we need more fighters in Libya. Turkey takes ISIS fighters in Syria, puts them on a plane and flies them to Libya. But Turkey sends them without heavy weaponry, armored vehicles. In other words, they are sent for slaughter. Whatever they will accomplish on a battlefield, it is a secondary matter. According to the available information confirmed by Flight Radar 24, by the way, regarding Iran, this source of information is unique, absolutely unique. By average assessments, Turkey airlifted about 3,500 fighters from Syria to Libya during December 30th, 31st, 2019.
All right. They were transferred. On January 2nd, Turkey made a decision to send an army to Libya. ISIS fighters were sent to be slaughtered by their request to have commanders. Thus, the Turkish connection to them will manifest one way or another. Well, on January 5th, Haftar forces in Libya struck three powerful blows. One at the military academy in Tripoli, one at the column of ISIS fighters, and one at the air base with Turkish military personnel, including those Turkish piloting unmanned drones. On January 5th, Turkish forces in Libya sustained severe losses. On January 7th, the Turkish reinforcement arrived. But because of January 5th's losses, they found themselves in a position of insufficient replacement and not reinforcement, as intended originally. What do we observe? Erdogan rushes to Putin. Vladimir Vladimirovich, I am in trouble. Help me. Vladimir Putin, of course, says, both of you, come to Moscow. We will have a 2 plus 2 meeting. In other words, Russia is fully in charge of governance processes also in Libya, and Erdogan, as always, made a fool of oneself. But that is not the point. Turkey is fading away as an actor in this region. It is obvious, Turkey has problems in Libya. Turkey is becoming a scapegoat. Erdogan asked for it himself. I said it before, do not interfere with Erdogan, let him be himself, and pretty soon we will be visiting the Russian city of Constantinople in the Anatolian Federal District. Erdogan is working very effectively on that task, but that is beside the point. We are talking about Iran now. Turkey is just a characteristic feature of the moment, but a very significant one. The point is that simultaneously with transferring ISIS fighters to Libya by Turks, Iran is transferring soldiers of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps to Iraq. The situation in Syria is better and IRGC fighters are being moved to Iraq and a number of transferred IRGC fighters is comparable to a number of ISIS fighters transferred to Libya, about three and a half thousand. What happened in Iraq? In Iraq the escalation began, and as a result one American soldier was killed. Shia units were hit, and mass protests began around American embassy. These protests were led by none other than Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, the right hand of Soleimani in Iraq. Al-Muhandis led that protest. So the US country lead faces the task, if the US must leave, that is exactly what Trump's government has been working on. As you know, a letter was published by accident and sent to the Iraqi government and so on. But the opposing US country lead needs to gain a foothold in Iraq to continue to be a gendarme worldwide, otherwise the US country lead will cave in as it has no resources to confront the global elite and Trump. The US country elite strives to stay at any cost. Accordingly, they need to avoid such an escalation in Iraq that will force the US to leave. And for this purpose, who do they need to put reins on? Right, on Iraqi forces. Iraq ceased to exist as a state after 2003. 
all processes in Iraq are managed by the American Embassy, which occupies 103 acres. The number of U.S. Embassy personnel at the best of times reached 17,000 people. But with the consulate in Erbil, with its 3,000 personnel, the total number was up to 20, 21,000 people. Later, there was a reduction, but how is the work of embassy structured? 2,000 diplomats, 16,000 support personnel. Half of the diplomats are cut down. Did anybody mention cuts of supporting personnel? And we know, when escalation around the embassy started, the United States decided to increase its presence in Iraq, not to decrease its presence, but to increase it. They needed to create conditions to avoid direct confrontation between the United States and Iran. In other words, to keep the unrest at such a level that the IRGC fighters wouldn't be involved to such an extent that this issue had to be resolved with Iran. What is the American way to deal with the problem? There is a man, there is a problem. No man, no problem. Al-Muhandis is Iraqi. Case closed. The strike had been targeted at him. But who died from the strike? Suleimani. And no one is mentioning that strike had Al-Muhandis as a target. Now Suleimani is dead. The reaction of the United States was so, they were in disbelief. How? How did this happen? Why did it happen? Who framed us? Trump used this situation and turned around his relations with the country elite inside the United States. Trump pushed them into a corner. Guys, either I fix this situation or your heads will roll. Someone has to be held responsible for the killing of Soleimani. There is another matter. Why was Soleimani there in the first place? Because the United States were structurally transferring governance over Iraq into the hands of Iran. And that is why Soleimani, figuratively speaking, kicked the doors of government offices open, where Americans entered more or less civilly, knocking or not, but not kicking doors. To keep heads from rolling off, to avoid a war with Iran, all country elite started to cry out, Pelosi, for example, how come? We have been framed. Explain it. Well, Trump can explain it, all right? Here they are, country elite generals. I will punish them publicly and tell everybody that they did it. There is one possible scenario. Did they permit themselves to conduct state politics, circumventing the president? Do you understand that it is a state crime and how you can be dealt with? Another thing is that the statehood of the United States itself will collapse, chaos arise, and that will be the end of it. The U.S. country elite understand it too. And that is why Democrats, by Democrats, I mean the real U.S. country elite, had no choice. Generals grudgingly went and stood with sourpuss faces behind Trump, emphasizing at every chance that they are in Trump's trenches since that moment on. No more confrontation with the president. By one particular strike, this task has been solved. But how was this task solved? Let's look back at history. Nothing is new under the sun. The same methods are used again and again. Is it possible that the United States and Iran cooperate? 
And how was Suleimani framed? Why did he end up on the strike side? One thing needs to be understood. It is impossible to structurally find those who framed Suleimani. But to find those who prepared a strike to get al muhandis is easy. And the question was put like this. We will explain to all countries' elites that Suleimani died by accident. But it is the global US elite who will do the explanation. You won't be able to do it anyway. And thus, we will solve this task. And Trump took it on himself to fix it. In other words, the US country elites yielded a very serious part of power authority within the United States itself in this confrontation with Trump. That means that a part of the US country elite sacrificed their clan corporative interests to save their butts. To understand how Suleimani was put in the line of fire, we need to remember one episode from the past. For example, the episode of computer technology development in the Soviet Union. Here is what I'm talking about. In 1962, academician Glushkov was authorized to create a nationwide automated data processing and control system, OGAS. The creation of this system would increase the effectiveness of state governance multifold and would make USSR country number one in the world. By 1964, by 1964 already, this system was ready in principle. But the most prominent economists, scientists such as Lieberman, Birman and others who later immigrated to Israel and the United States opposed this system. They were adamantly against this system. They were saying that it will result in slowing down of economy management and so on. Nothing was getting done. By 1967, the issue of implementation of this system was imminent. But in 1967, almost simultaneously, two articles were published in The Guardian and The Washington Post. The article published in The Guardian was titled Punch Card Rules the Kremlin. Those articles were of subpar level, but what was important? Both articles convey the message that Glushkov wanted to replace Politburo by punch card. In other words, the political management would become obsolete if August system is implemented. It was a completely different position. Apparently, the effectiveness of this system was very high, on the contrary to the arguments of Lieberman and Berman who insisted that the system will only complicate things. The West saw it completely different. And Politburo became nervous. How so? We can let do something, getting some privileges, but we cannot allow to encroach on our political functions. The opposition to August was growing and was supported as follows. In 1972, newspaper Izvestia published the article by Milner, deputy director of the Institute for the US and Canadian Studies, director Arbatov, where the author argues that computer is rubbish, that capitalists in the West buy computers just to show off, to be fancy by having such a toy. But in general, computers are not needed in any way, totally useless. And Politburo said, yes, the Institute for the US and Canadian Studies knows what they are talking about. 
The decision was made to close Ogas. The West was delighted. Until 1977, all materials on this program were strictly classified, and then the vast majority of them were destroyed. Computer equipment for household and national economic purposes has not been developed in our country. The military held their positions, and that is why in the military computers worked fine and provided spaceships launches very well. But a common man didn't have a computer. In the West, everybody had a computer at home, but we didn't have them. We used calculators. Because under such a powerful pressure, our Politburo decided that we shouldn't produce our own computers and will copy Western computers when needed. Politburo didn't understand one thing. Firstly, what is released is already outdated. Secondly, while you copy and while you start production, it will become obsolete at all. That is, you will lose technological leadership in the entire industry. Politburo had its own political interests. They were not interested in having a computer in every family. They were not interested in having computers in the industry. It was important for them to keep their political supremacy, which ended with their death and state destruction. In this example, there are obviously coordinated actions, but those actions cannot be formalized as a structural conspiracy. But supra-state governance is evident here to the full. That means there were people who purposefully destroyed their own country to the benefit of the foreign country. In the confrontation between the Soviet Union, Russia, and the West, they worked to undermine the USSR. If we understand that there is global politics and there is supra-state governance, then everything becomes obvious. How the Soviet Union was undermined, led to perestroika, and how it was destroyed. Also, it becomes obvious that there is no problem for the global U.S. elite and the global Iran elite to establish a dialogue, and accordingly, Iran's government can easily eliminate unfunterable Soleimani, who didn't fit any scenario, who suited better as a martyr. So Soleimani was sent with a certain mission. Al-Muhandis came to meet him. Voila! The assassination was targeting Al-Muhandis, but Soleimani was killed. And media hype is on. But Iran must retaliate. Soleimani is a national hero. What to do next? If Iranian response to American strike is weak, then Iranian standing suffers. If the Iranian response is strong, it means a war. So a wise decision is taken. Even mass media are publishing real facts that Iran informed Iraq about the upcoming strike at the basis of the United States. You see, to inform the Iraqi government about the upcoming strike at the American basis is the same as to call an American officer on duty in Iraq and say, at such a time you will be hit. And when media reports that there are no casualties, it is a very possible outcome for one simple reason. Some say Americans would not be able to leave. Really? The strike was done on January 8th, but on January 7th, video appeared on the Internet with empty American bases. 
In other words, only guards were left at the bases, but most of the troops were withdrawn. The bases were left empty, and the video was put on the Internet. Not for our pleasure, but to leave a message, everything is ready for the missile attack. The missile attack took place. As Russian satirist Saltykov Shidrin put it, Fox thought he would cause real bloodshed, and there he goes eating siskins. Iran had to show that retaliatory strike was of appropriate scale. Iranian mass media reported that the number of killed Americans somewhere in trillions. Our strike was pretty serious, but very soon it became clear that the information field is universal and information leaks in Iran too. And Iran replies, we didn't have a goal to kill Americans, we wanted to destroy the military equipment only, and we destroyed all of it by surgical strikes. Here the next question arises, what to do next? That is it. The main pressure by Iranian people requesting revenge is off. Through the massive funeral of Soleimani, the missile attack on American bases, the pressure is off. Now we can take a breath and move forward. And what is happening at this moment? Yes, a plane is blowing up and most casualties are Iranians, either Iranian citizens or citizens of other countries, but in most part they are all Iranians. For example, 60 Canadians were of Iranian origin. And accordingly, there is a completely different angle. What happened? How did it happen? Who is responsible? Why are they responsible? Everything related to this plane is very, very interesting, and not at all as we are told. Despite the fact that Iran took responsibility for this act, I am probably the only one, I haven't heard it from anybody else at least, who is saying, Iran didn't shoot down that plane, despite all apologies and so on. So what happened? In general, when we are beginning to describe such mysteries, I always say, everything is not as it seems. Look deeper in the process and everything will look in a completely different light. How did it really happen? So, Suleimani was killed on January 3rd. But on January 4th, Polish airline LOT sharply and without explanation of any reasons announced flights cancellations over Iran and to Iran for an indefinite time. What does this have to do with anything? What kind of outburst is it? But if you have noticed that, you have to look further. And further, the following happens. On January 8th, almost simultaneously with Iranian missile attack at American bases in Iraq, the plane falls and crashes. Let's put it that way. Uh, 
out of the blue, both engines catch fire, the plane falls and crashes. Someone is taking video of the crash. The video was criticized left and right already. And we are being told that the Iranian air defense system made a mistake and shoot down this plane. In Iran, at the end, confessed. Confessed! A lot of things can be said here. But we will mention several facts. During three hours, since the last missile attack on Erbil, to the crash of this plane, at the airport of Tehran, nine flights arrived, arrived at least nine. I count those flights, which can be considered a target for retaliation attack. The rumor was that the retaliation attack was expected. That means at most risk were planes heading to Tehran. But what happened? The plane, which was shut down, flew from Tehran. The plane flew according to a certain prearranged traffic route and was in radio contact with the air traffic controller. I understand that mistakes are possible, but it is hard to accept the official version that the operator of the air defense system confused the outbound climbing target with the inbound descending target, which should be a priority target. I'm sorry, but it is pretty unbelievable. I repeat, there are three factors. The corridor with regular air traffic. The target is moving away from its potential target. The plane didn't deviate towards any military installations. The plane was flying within the corridor, which is confirmed by old documents. The plane was ascending, flying away from Tehran within the approved air corridor, and it was shot down. At the same time, nine other planes, which were flying from the direction of possible retaliatory attack, landed safely in this airport. There is more than that. Let's narrow it down. Air float plane flew out by the same corridor one hour before the Ukrainian plane. Let's narrow it down more. Two Turkish and one Ukrainian planes took off 20 minutes prior to the accident. Two Turkish planes safely leave, but Ukrainian. Do you see? An interval between planes is six minutes. Within 20 minutes, the three planes take off one after another. The interval is six minutes. Two Turkish planes and one Ukrainian proceed along the same corridor, and only Ukrainian plane is shut down. Let's look at the Iran's actions before the admission of guilt. What does Iran do? In six hours, Iran has a proof that the plane crashed as a result of the blast on board. Iran has it. Iran refuses to send black boxes to Boeing and the United States. 
Iran vigorously requests a wide international investigation of the crash. Iran needs more experts. By the way, regarding Boeing MH17, which was shut down over Donbass in 2014, if the plane had fallen on Russian territory, Russia, which has the equipment to read black boxes, it would have had a wide international presence of all countries, including Malaysia, China and other countries. There would have been no chance to blame Russia for shooting down the plane. That is why it was matter of principle to drop the plane on Ukrainian territory, even on the territory within combat actions, but in Ukraine. That is why the missile damaged Boeing and the fighter jet which was patrolling in the area specifically for that moment, shut it down to ensure that plane falls in Ukrainian territory. Iran succeeded. Plane fell in Iran. This is an interesting situation. But let's see what would have happened if it had been a little different. So what if the time of missile attack is changed and the plane takes off on time, not delayed for one hour. In that case, the plane would have blown up over the Erbil region. What region was targeted by Iranians during its missile attack? Erbil. The second strike was exactly at Erbil. If to postpone a little bit, but even without a delay, the strike took place at 3 a.m. and the plane took off on time. The official statement by IRGC in English related to the missile strike announced that Iran conducted the missile strike of retaliation by air-to-air -air missiles. Of course, it was ballistic missiles, which became clear later, and moreover, it was ballistic missiles of the new generation. And accordingly, Iran, same as the global elite, backing Iran up, would love to test these missiles and test specifically how these missiles hit American bases. Out of 15 missiles, only 11 reached targets. Four missiles fell in the desert. The air defense system wasn't activated because it was an experiment, research, new missiles were studied. But what is crucially important is that IRGC announced, quote-unquote by mistake, that the strike was conducted by air-to-air -air missiles. The Ukrainian plane could have crashed in the Erbil region. It would look like the strike is conducted by air-to-air -air missiles. The Ukrainian plane falls as a result of internal blasts in both engines. And then everything would have been different. It would have been obvious to all. It is Iran that shot down the plane by striking Iraq. Iran is a terrorist. That would have been exactly what the US country elite needed. But the plane's departure was delayed. Why? Because the global elite are not fools. That is why on January 4th, Polish airline LOT cancelled its flights. But sacrificial plane was to be appointed. And on January 6th, as international airlines of Ukraine announced, the plane that crashed near Tehran had technical inspection. Of course, IAU has a license to do maintenance, but there is one nuance. On January 6th, this plane was in London. Maybe it went through quote-unquote maintenance there, where bombs were planted in its engines. In the beginning, all sides stuck to one version. Yes, it was a technical malfunction. 
The United States, both Trump and Pompeo, the Ukrainian airlines and others understood that Iran has cast iron evidence and it is better to blame it on technical malfunction. What images were posted in first reports on the Ukrainian Boeing shutdown? The photographs of the crash scene of the Malaysian Boeing in Donbass in 2014. According to the presented photos of Ukrainian Boeing, it was clear that the rotor blade flew out through the engine case. Blades moved inside out, edges of perforation holes were bent outwards like nobody's business. So Iran demands, no matter what, Iran has all the evidence on hand. Iran can prove that it is not involved, that it becomes a victim of a terrorist attack, that the plane was blown up. And suddenly, on January 11th, Iran says, we shot it down. Why? So Iran demands international experts, but experts are not in a hurry. Iran says, we won't give away black boxes. Give us specialists and give equipment. We will pay for everything. But nobody gives them anything. Iran agreed to send black boxes to France, but under wide international inspection. It doesn't happen either. And then Iran was left with a simple choice. In other words, Iran ran into American lackeys, united front in governance and in mass media. The US country elite efficiently blocked Iran. Iran wants to prove its innocence. It needs international experts. It needs equipment. But no one is helping Iran. But Iran had a solution. Could have had one. If Iran only was open to it. There is one country which was not involved and which could help Iran. It is Russia. Russia has specialists. Russia has the equipment. And there is an opportunity to break through the information blockade. But to cooperate with Russia, Iran must change its conception of governance. But Iran wants so much to become a world hegemon. Iran was promised that. Hussein's Iraq was destroyed for them. Now Iraq is being handed to Iran. The whole Middle East is being handed. Central Asia. Iran is entering everywhere. Iran is provided with everything. Can it refuse these gifts? For the sake of building relations with the world according to the Russian principles? No, Iran doesn't want that. That is why Iran cannot negotiate anything with Russia. What did Iran want from Russia and Syria? You destroyed terrorists? Good. Now our magnificence allow you to leave. That is why they behave that way. Do you need to destroy terrorists? It is convenient for you to use a jump-up base in Iran? We will provide it, but on our conditions. We said what? Thanks. Don't bother. We have our own conception of governance. That is why Iran cannot even address to Russia without changing conception of governance. It is impossible. But Iran decided to be a tough guy. Iran, in reality, it is the global elite who manages all these processes. Iran takes the blame upon itself. Iranians died. Regardless of citizenship, they are Iranians. We shoot down them by mistake. They don't mention what air defense system was used. To avoid further questions, to take the blame upon themselves. We are honest. And everything starts to get quieter and quieter. And everybody says, and Trump says, they shot it by mistake. It happens. There is such attention in the region. 
In other words, Iran, in fact, playing the honest one. Yes, there was a mistake, we admitted it, and ready to pay compensations, even more, so that the compensations will be to Iranians. Iranians died. This is our internal problem. Everybody worldwide understood that Iran has completely different standing in the world, realizing that the global elite outsmarted the US country elite. American lackeys in Ukraine fell into a feat. Let's put sanctions on Iran. We don't believe them. Let's jump on them. More. Iran should kneel before us. So Iran has its own problems. The first problem is the conflict with the United States, non-resolved to the logical end. When instead of ultimate defeat, the United States received just appearance of defeat, and both parties went to their corners. What should one understand here? To avoid a big war, Trump ordered to pull back all military ships 1,000 miles away, all kilometers, I don't remember and it is not important, from Iran's shores to sort things out, to calm it all. And here's the main problem. We circle back to what? State politics, governance, is established dynamic balance of different clan cooperative groups' capabilities, their proportion, to use the government system and its mechanisms for reaching their narrow clan cooperative goals. Iran has a very serious elite stratum, which wants to sell their own country and be accepted in the Western world on any terms, on any. The country doesn't matter for them. Well, we have in Russia our own, Chubais, Medvedev and others. What to do with them? What task must be solved to build up the clan cooperative group in Iran that will work towards making Iran the concentration center of global governance. What events took place after the planes crash? It wasn't shut down, it was blown up. Massive protests. As always, students make a rocket. And suddenly the ambassador of Great Britain shows up there and got arrested. What is his business to be at the protest conducted by Iranian citizens? What the ambassador is doing there? The ambassador has a completely different protocol of engagement with the state. If you want to express condolences, you can officially visit a minister, or even to request a meeting with the president, or to ask for an audience with Ayatollah himself. There are different options. But he decided to go to protests, and he was arrested. I repeat, Soleimani is a cult figure in Iran. But on those protests, there are anti-government slogans and most important, Soleimani portraits are being destroyed, defiantly destroyed and Great Britain's ambassador is apprehended. And it is shown to all Iran. Did you want a good attack on the USA? Yes. For us to retaliate to the death of Soleimani? But we have internal traitors. Look at them. What do they do? Who is giving orders? The ambassador of Great Britain. What do they do? Look, are you paying tribute to Soleimani? Is he a martyr for you? But what they do with his portrait? And why was the plane shut down? Because 
there was an escalation of tension with the United States and others. Could it be that one of the people who were now manifesting here was sitting at the missile operator's desk? Should we check the army? Do you see the spectrum of possibilities for cleansing the elite, for strengthening the position of these clan cooperative groups in Iran? They solve all tasks at once. Here's the piece of advice to the country elite, not to mention those who even cannot be called a country elite. Don't seek to play at the same table with the global elite. The global elite always has four jokers in their hands. This is very briefly. Every aspect can be discussed further. But in principle, I think, this is enough. How long have we been working? One hour and fifteen minutes already. You see, in fact, we can say that it was a single question. In fact, all that is left to do is to say goodbye. What do I want to say? Look, when one has mastered the methodology of information processing and looks at mass media materials, then for him everything becomes clear. When one understands that certain spectacle is unveiling before his eyes, understands that actors of this performance are mere puppets and where the puppeteer is hiding, who is the director of the show, who wrote the script, then the whole picture becomes obvious. But how can one understand it? Only when one has knowledge of how complex social supersystems governance goes on. And this knowledge is given only in one source, the conception of social safety, COP. That is why you need to learn how complex social supersystems are governed, become conceptually powerful, protect your interests and interests of your family. Be happy, peaceful skies over your head. See you next time.